Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's guest Top Talk webinar. Hi, Richard. I know I have you in the wings. We've been chatting briefly. If you remember to unmute Hello. yourself. There we go. I can hear you. How are you, mate? Uh -huh. Very well, thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have had a slight privilege of a behind the scenes sort of run through with you. So I know what the guys are going to get to see. Richard, before we do uh, hand the screen over to you, because we've got I know we've got a lot to cover tonight, which is great. Just tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into photography and how you kind of got into the you know work. I know Guinness Book of Records, but how you got into sort of advertising and commercial photography. Yeah. Um... Uh, well, I'm an old boy, really. I've been at this game for about 30 years, although it's, uh, uh, it never seems like it, but you look back and think, my goodness, it's been 30 years. Um, uh, I started off working up in the north, in well, Midlands, in, in Nottingham, um, which I have to say I recommend, actually, uh, because it gives you a really good grounding. It's a bit, uh, I soon moved to London. But the problem, I love London, but the problem with it is that you kind of need to specialise um, in London in the commercial world. So I think I had quite a big advantage because I started working in the Midlands and therefore you have to ha have a really good rounded um, portfolio and work in lots of different areas. So I got a lot of rounded experience, which I think really bore fruit later on. Moved to London um, uh, about 20 years ago, 20 years ago, God, am I that old? Um, uh, and uh, quickly established myself um, as an advertising guy, really. That's what I always wanted to do. Um, it's quite a difficult nut to crack, but I worked very hard at it. Um, I'm very, very, very um, keen on the marketing side of my business. I, I think it's really important. You know, 50% of what you do as a, photo a professional photographer has to be marketing and business, as well as, obviously, increasing your technical skills as a photographer. So I sort of traipsed around magazines and um, ad agencies, showed them my work, got a lot of experiences along the way, made a lot of mistakes, but slowly established myself. Um, and uh, um, I think I, you know, I'm kind of quite well known now in, that, in the area of people photography. I shoot a lot both here and in the States. Um, but I also, by the way, have a very, very big uh, following in the general public now. I produce a book called The Children of London, I do over a hundred children shoots around London every year. We raise money for Great Ormond Street Hospital, produce a beautiful book, and the Queen receives a copy, and it's all very grand and very wonderful. Um, and it's fantastic fun. So, uh, yeah, I've, I've got quite a rounded portfolio, I guess. Oh, brilliant, mate. Um, and we have discussed, and because uh, obviously there were different areas that we were going to look at, in, and hopefully I'd love to have you come back um, in, a, in a few weeks' time or a month or so, and we'll have a look at that, uh, that the children of London. I think it'd be a great topic to and uh, to, to raise awareness Absolutely for. Absolutely lovely. Brilliant. Richard, I'm going to hand you the screen, mate. Hello. Welcome. Thank you very much, guys, for tuning in, for webbing in, or... Um, whatever the modern parlance is. Um, uh, thank you very much to Jay. Um, I have to commend you guys as being part of the, uh, the Photography Academy. I think it's a great organization um, and uh, I think you made a good choice. Um, <clears throat> I've got lots of pictures to show you, a um, lot of stuff to get through. Uh, I hope I don't overrun. Please do, do ask questions because I do a lot of seminars both on the marketing side of things, the business side of things, but also obviously on the on the shooting technical side. Um, and I always say to people, this is a participation sport. It's not a dictatorship. So um, please do ask questions um, because I'll feel very lonely if you don't. Um, uh, okay, so let's get going. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit first of all about um, uh, how I established my relationship with a client like Guinness World Records. I've been incredibly lucky. I've been with them for, uh, I couldn't believe it. We looked back the other day, it's been nine years now. They're probably my longest lived client. Um, and I had to think back to how it all started. And it was in, believe it or not, in 2006, uh, what actually happened was that um, at that time I had a studio in Central Covent Garden, quite a big studio, and I was very well known for doing studio work, big, big studio sets. Um, uh, I think the biggest thing I ever did, in fact, was I hired a film studio called Black Island Studios in Acton, and we built half of a football pitch including stadium lighting and goal posts and everything for some ads for the European uh, Football Cup. And that was probably the height of the, the sort of studio uh, set builds that I was doing. Um, pr 
problem with it is that if you do studio stuff and you have a big studio, you have to fill it and then you do more of it and then you get more of it and then all you end up doing is one studio shoot after another studio shoot and I really wanted to get outside. Um, so like, uh, like I know how to market and the only way to do it is to go and do it. So I went out and did some uh, um, quite a few um, test shoots, uh, try to get the flavour going. Uh, and I looked this up earlier in the week, check this out. Um, this is a mailer that I sent out in 2006, which um, the shots on the left are both test shoots. Uh, the shot on the right was a job that actually, as you can see, it started off, it was actually built in a studio, but then it looked kind of fairly location-y. So I was out there saying to people, look, I can do location stuff as well. Um, uh, I sent it out to over 4,000 agencies in both uh, the UK and in the States, a few in mainland Europe as well, um, and I got a fairly good response and backed it up by going to see them with portfolio viewings and so on, um, and uh, I got this job for a, a, um, an insurance company. Uh, this was shot on the south coast. Um, we had a big rainmaker. Um, there, um, as in fire engines and so on, lots of fun. Uh, most of my work tends to have a bit of humour in it as well, um, which kind of sat well. Um, this is a great fun shoot, great models, they work very hard, bless them. Um, I then got a lovely little uh, account, which is Tango, um, which is probably well known to most people. And this really made, uh, made ways for me and got uh, a lot of attention. So late in 2006, I had a phone call from a chap called Craig Glenday. Craig, um, lovely man, is uh, the editor-in-chief of the Guinness Book of World Records. He still is today, in fact. He's been there for a while. Um, and luckily for me, he really liked my work. He said to me, can I come and see him, have a chat about uh, doing some shots of the book, which I was very, 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 very pleased about. Um, when I turned up, uh, we went through some various different uh, stuff in my book and so on, um, and Craig explained to me that what they needed from me was a bit special. Um, the book itself, as you probably know, is made up of a lot of snapshots, a lot of news shots of records being done. What they didn't have at that time um, were bigger high production advertising shots, and he said, what we want you to do is that. We want shots that we can use for billboard advertising uh, all over the world, that we can use for PRing, we can use it for big double page spread intro pages and so on. Um, and that is your brief, um, uh, fantastic brief, obviously I was just thrilled to bits with it. So he then um, promptly offered me a lovely two week trip to the States and uh, sod's law being what it is, I couldn't do it because I had other commitments which is rather difficult, um, so I had to walk away. Uh, I don't actually know uh, whether they used somebody else or whatever, but they must have done, I guess. I don't know who it was, but clearly uh, it didn't work out because they called me again the following year and I was available. So 2007, I did my first shoot for these guys. Um, it's, uh, I'm going to bring up the first shot for them now. This wasn't done, funnily enough, this wasn't done on the first uh, run. This is actually in the second year, but you can see the style similarities between the Tango shot that I did there and and this um, image. This image has been uh, very successful for me. I used it consequently in mailers and, uh, and other things. It's been all over the world, been reprinted everywhere, it appeared in the Sunday Times amongst other things. Um, and uh, has been a really big favourite image of mine. It's also one of the most impressive records I think I've ever seen in my life. Um, this guy is called Darren Taylor, aka Professor Splash. Do look him up on the web and watch him do his thing. Um, he is quite incredible. He has the Guinness World Record for diving into a paddling pool. If any of you guys out there fancy challenging this record, uh, then be my guest. Uh, the record is one of the most amazing I've ever seen. Uh, believe it or not, I think it's currently with him at 36 feet, I think it is. That is the top of a three-story building, and the criteria are that it has to be a commercially available paddling pool, uh, 
and it has to be no deeper than 12 inches. By the way, yes, I did say 12 inches, uh, and he does dive into it from 36 feet. Um, extraordinary man. Uh, this image, um, I think, uh, it's fairly typical in many, many ways of the images that I do for Guinness and all that, but I'm moving forward with them. I was employed to tell stories to, uh, we're not here to record the record as such. People are always saying to me that you must see some fantastic world records being set, and in fact, I hardly ever see a record being set. I'm only called in after the record's done. These guys have usually established themselves for some years before I'm called up. Um, it's my brief to give a different edge to them. So um, there's a kind of an interesting uh, combination, I guess, between the amount of previous knowledge that we have on the shots and then the kind of advertising quality that they want me to bring to them. Um, uh, and this was fairly typical in that respect. Let me show you how this shot was set up. And you'll notice immediately some interesting things as regards to the way that they're manipulated. Uh, <clears throat> just in case you don't know what 36 feet looks like, that's what it looks like. Uh, we shot here in Colorado, uh, is it Colorado? Denver, Denver, Colorado, yeah. Denver Showground. One of the powers of Guinness World Records is it is in fact the largest selling non-religious book in the world and you'll find that people around the world have a deep love for it. I always say that I think next to the Olympic Games it probably has more pulling power than any other brand I've ever worked for. Consequently, we're able to pull a lot of favours wherever we go. And um, uh, I often turn up, and this is a fairly good example, we often turn up at a location with a fairly good idea of what we want to do as a, as a, a concept, but no actual uh, recce has been done, no actual previous has been done as I would do for an advertising shoot. So on this occasion we turned up, Darren lives uh, next to a, a three lane highway, so there's no way we could do that, but up the road was a showground. We, we turned up the day before, we went to the showground, we told them we were from Guinness World Records, we told them what we wanted to do, and amazingly they said, yeah, go ahead and do it. Uh, I then decided I wanted to shoot from above Darren, you saw the previous picture, so my assistant Chris was tasked to get us a cherry picker. I'd been in the States the year before, I think the year before, year before that, shooting something else, and I'd used a, a, a cherry picker company called Sunshine Vehicles, um, and we called them up, and yes, guess what, they turned up for nothing. I know this sounds incredible, but these guys just love to support uh, Guinness World Records, so we use that as part of our brief to keep our costs at a minimum um, and make it all work out. That's my wonderful California sun bounce that I use a lot of, but what I also use a lot of, as you saw in the previous image, is the sun itself. Let me flip back to it. The sun itself is a big light source for me. I love it. Um, and when I work outdoors, I'm always looking for it. I'm a big backlight, backlight freak. Um, in the studio or out of it, I love backlight. I always light my, my sets from the back first and then move forward and fill in from the front. So the sun is the greatest light source in the world, and I do use it extensively in my shots. I don't try and avoid it. Also, I'm not setting up uh, early morning, late night fashion stuff. I'm not making people look beautiful. I'm making people look real. So I can shoot throughout the day, high sun, low sun, middle sun, not a problem for me. Um, I'll work with it. So you can see the, the sun bounce is bouncing that sun back into him. We're also, I wanted to get a bit more character out of the, uh, the images in general. So um, I've got my battery powered lighting. You can see at the base there, there's two basic lights, bare heads banging straight up there. It's a big set, this, so we needed to get some sparkle coming off the, um, the, uh, the tower itself. Um, uh, I travel with a small kit. I usually have two power packs of around about 1,000 watts each and four heads. Um, I rarely use more than three heads, but I always want to have a backup, so that's really important. And they're all battery powered. Um, obviously, we are at a location, so we don't have much else to use. Um, <coughs> now, I also, and this shot, I looked for a shot to give to try and show this, but one of the things I noticed in the, uh, the shot when we set it up was that I wanted to get some personality in his face. I wanted to have his goggles on, but I needed some a little kick in his eyes. Um, so. If you look carefully, you can see I'm actually using an on-camera flash. Um, to sync that with the packs, we had to be fairly 
slow and low down on the on the shutter speed. So I'm shooting at around about a thirtieth of a second, which is fine because I can rack it right up to f22. Um, uh, and the sunshine's working for me beautifully. The light fills in, and the flash gets a little kick in there. Let me just show you that shot again, so you can see what I mean. You see how the eyes have got that little kick in the eyes, and you can see a little a little shadow under his chin there as well. So I really am using a lot of of light sources, but in a very simple way. You will notice that I'm very boring when it comes to lighting, um, uh, in that I use very much that same setup on every shot that I do, and. It's for good reason, because A, because it works, it's what I call, I mean, this is four lights in effect, but I call it a three light setup. A, because it works, B, because we're traveling all over the world, and we need to have a personality to the shots that works, uh, and I need to be able to replicate that wherever I can. So the sun will be my will be one of my sources, and usually two heads will be the others. Um, there are some exceptions to that, and you'll see some in a moment. But generally, I light from behind, and that's what I like to do. So let me show you another example. Uh, this is a more recent shoot I did uh, um, in Austria. Uh, these guys are the big boom built the largest drum kit in the world, um, and you'll see, you see the sun there coming straight through the top there, that's not falsified, that's not retouched in, that is the real deal. Um, uh, what I do with shots like this so a lot, you'll notice that the guy on the right hand side there is leaping in the air, the other guy's playing the drums and so on. If you've got large groups of people like this, I all, by the way, I always, always shoot with a tripod. You won't find me floating around with a handheld camera. And there's a very good reason for that. I would say a good 50% of my image quality comes from the post-production, um, uh, which means that I'm blending shots together, working them together. But I like to get what I can in camera. So rather than shooting these guys as separate people and then blending and then putting them all together one by one, what I will do is shoot them as a foursome like this, uh, and then I will go through the shots at the end of the day and with the editor, and we'll work out what's the best shot of the guy on the left, the guy in the right, the guy in the middle, the guy in the center middle, um, and then we'll match it up with the best background shot so the sun's peeking through perfectly. I then had this had to adapt all the shadows and so on to make it work on that basis. So rather than having to get everybody just right at the actual moment that the sun peeks through the, uh, the symbols there, I was able to choose my moments and then pick each of the sweet moments for each of them and blend them all together. Um, this is my setup. You can see, lo and behold, look again. There we go. Two front lights and the backlight being the sun. Uh, very boring, but it works. This is me setting up. Um, we had a little bit of rain. You can see we're, we're using the umbrellas there to actually shield the packs from the from the rain. Um, and we've got big plastic bags wrapped around the, the heads themselves. It's very important to do this because the last thing you want is rain in your in your packs. Um, uh, I then uh, stole their forklift truck. They'd actually set this set up, believe it or not, it takes them about two hours to set this thing up. It weighs tons and have to do with the forklift truck. And they set it on, if you imagine to the right of the picture there, I can't, you can't quite see it, but there's a fence. And they've managed to set this up in the morning before we arrived behind the fence. So they've got the fence in between them and the backdrop. So of course, the first thing I said was, guys, can you move it? Um, so they moved the whole lot from one side, there's only about 20 feet, but from the one side of the fence into the field there. If you look carefully as well at the drum kit, you can see there's wooden blocks um, underneath the feet, and you can see that very well there. Uh, but those were there because the ground I set it up on was completely uneven, so we had to block it up um, uh, bit by bit. But you'll notice in the shot itself when you see the, the finish, oh, there's the fence. You can see it. Oh, they set it up behind that fence, which was, wasn't very brilliant of them. Um, uh, but Bless their hearts. We like to make them work for it. It's good stuff. Um, so yeah, so you can see in the finished shot, there's no wooden blocks. They're all gone, but that's been retouched out. All the grass is made perfect. We've got the best background shot, the best foreground, the best image of every one of them, and it all works together to get a beautiful image. And uh, I love it. I shoot a lot in Austria. I don't know why. There's a lot of you're going to see a lot of Austrian shots. I noticed this when I went through earlier. Um, but um, yeah, Austria's full of nutters. It's great. Great country. Richard, I'm I'm going to jump in, bud. Hello, um, hello mate. Yeah. As we said, we go through some questions as we go, and I just 
they have started, uh, so I think it'd be better that we get a few out of the way, otherwise we'll uh, have a marathon question at the end of the no um, So, uh, well, a couple of things that came up as you were talking about getting started, really, at the beginning. Uh, this was quite a nice question that came through from Gary. He said, um, as a photography student at the moment, uh, based in Scotland, I was wondering what the best way to get into commercial photography is. What's what's the best tips and tricks when he's, he's, for him to get going with, bud? Wow, um, that's a big question, isn't it? I mean, I could be here all night answering that. What's the best way to get into commercial photography? First of all, I would say have a lot of confidence in your own work. Um, it's really important. Um, uh, if you don't believe in yourself, then nobody else will. I spent a lot of time slogging around um, with my book, going all, I mean, I've got a million stories I can tell you. Um, as I said before, I started off working outside London just because I think it gave me a really, I mean, it wasn't that I chose to do that, that's what happened, I, I'm from i am from the Midlands anyway, um, but I think it gave me a really great grounding in everything from working in deep coal mines um, when they existed, I, hey guys, I'm old enough to remember old deep set coal mines, I think the last one closed about a year ago, um, but everything from deep set coal mines to flying over volcanoes in, in the Caribbean, um, uh, and everywhere in between. So, I mean, I really have worked in factories. I've worked underground. I've worked overground. I've worked in. I've done little still life setups for perfume companies, and I've done massive, huge sets and room sets. And I think that gave me a good grounding, a good round, round sense of what I wanted to do. In terms of actually getting the work itself, you've got to put together a portfolio, and you've got to be committed to it. Um, don't follow the herd. Uh, create your own your own statement, your own style, have confidence with it. If you can get yourself a good mentor, I think it's really important. Um, this isn't a plug for me, but I do do mentoring, and I've got uh, about four or five guys on the go at the moment, um, and uh, I think it makes a big difference if you get the right mentor. Um, the Academy are, are wonderful, a wonderful resource for that. Um, uh, and I think that that's a, a really important factor. You've got to go out and make appointments. Um, another thing, I, I mean, I, I can talk about marketing all night, um, but I think it's really, really important to log what you do. I, I have a marketing system that um, maybe on another webinar we can start to talk about that I use called RAW, which is R O A. Uh, R O R O A R, not R A W, um, which is research, organize, action, response. Um, so research your subject, research your market, mate. It's really important to make sure you know who you who you look at, who you're marketing at, to out there. Then organize your your marketing according to that, whether it's emailers, whether it's mailers, whether it's. Don't forget as well the best marketing and advertising is to hit them right where it hurts. These guys are advertisers, so they want interesting, creative ideas. So chuck a brick to the window with a with a picture on it. Um, set, a, set your tent up outside the agency and get them in the morning. Um, uh, mad, mad ideas often do work to get these guys' attention, and then get in to see them. So action, get in there, get in to see them, get some appointments, get going with it. If you get one appointment in an ad agency, a very good tip, if you get one appointment with one art director that says he wants to see you, ring up all, get the lists and get all the other art directors in the agency, they've probably got 10, 12, 20 of them, and ring them all up and say, hi, I'm coming to see Jim on Friday, I mean, he mentioned that, that you had some work coming up, can I come and see you while I'm there? It's amazing how that works. Uh, another good technique is to ring up if you want to get in there, ring up and, and use the first name of the creative director or the art director that you want to get in there. So don't ring up and say, hi, I want to speak to Jerry Smith, please. Ring up and say, hi, I want to speak to Jerry. Is Jerry there today? Now, it gives an assumption that you kind of know who he is, and so it's a nice little tip to get through the first boundaries so you can actually get to speak to the guys. You'll find that when you get to the art directors themselves, they're normally young guys, young teams like you and I, not, not like I, like you, um, and they want to speak to people, they want to see people, but they're, the agency themselves will set up a whole load of barriers so that people can't get to them for understandable reasons. So um, I hope those tips are helpful. I know that some of them are a bit vague, uh, but it really is a massive, massive subject. I would say go to bikini lists or um, uh, file FX, get some listings of agencies, send an email out to the, the chosen agencies, you can choose these uh, these lists and I'm sure that Jay will fill you in on some uh, on how you get these lists and so on. Um, email them, 
back them up with a mailer and then uh, check out your clicks and your click-throughs and then respond through to them, call them up and make appointments and go and see them. You've got to put the legwork in. Okay, yeah. I hope that helps. Yeah, definitely, mate. Um, one last question on that note then before we keep going because we've still got a lot to go through, I know. Um, you referred yeah. to, I think it was back in the early days, you referred to a mail-out you did yourself back in 2007. And was it, was it yeah. right? did you say there was 4,000? Is that correct? Yeah, I, 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 that, yeah, that is, yeah. yeah. I, I actually mail fewer than that these days um, because I like to keep it a little tighter but I was uh, mailing but basically through uh, people like, uh, I personally at the moment am using bikini lists uh, but I've used file FX in the past as well and some of the other agencies um, but these guys are very sophisticated in that you can drill down so you can get a list of UK agencies, UK small agencies, London agencies, Southeast agencies, Manchester agencies, agencies that specialize in cars, agencies that specialize in food. You can really drill down. So you're emailing exactly the right people. And my uh, my trick uh, on this, which, which works really, really well all the time, is that once you know that they've clicked through, because that, sorry, you, you'll then get information from the, uh, the listings company. So you can see who's clicked on your ad, and then you can see who's clicked through to your website from the ad. Now, if somebody clicks through to your website, they're obviously interested. So get their telephone number, ring them up within five days of, of the email arriving. Ring them up, but don't tell them that you know they've clicked through. Ring them up on the basis of like, hi, I just want to give you a call. My name is Richard Bradbury. Um, I think you may be interested in seeing some of my work. I'd love to come and get an appointment to see you. Wow, the guy goes, yeah, do you know what? I was looking at your work the other day. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, absolutely. Well, fantastic. Great. That's lovely. And really makes a big difference. So use the technology. Really important. Brilliant. Brilliant. Top tips, mate. Right, let's crack on. Uh, we've only got a few, but they're sort of general questions, and I know we've still got quite a lot of images to share with them. Back to you, mate. Lovely. Uh, Cecily Skog, look at this lady. None of you will ever be that tough, and none of you will ever be that beautiful, I promise you. She's about the size of Kylie Minogue. She is an Arctic explorer. This is one of the few occasions where we went abroad to do a single shot. It doesn't happen very often, um, only if it's a very special record holder as she is. I normally will normally do a trip. I'll talk later on about how we organize the trips, but we normally do trips of about two to three weeks, and we'll shoot somewhere between a dozen to 16 shoot along the, uh, on that time on that time span but this one was a biggie she is uh, based in Norway she's Norwegian uh, and the idea of the shot really was to show her doing her thing in the Arctic um, so that was my brief I was given a fair bit of information beforehand and the reason that I like this it's one of my favorite images I, I, I like the image very much and, and I think one of the reasons that I do is because I know how much work doing it. Um, uh, one of the critical factors with being a photographer in the commercial world is that people expect a certain level of excellence from you. And what that means is that they expect you to be able to solve the problems before they happen. So what I mean by that is that there's no point in turning up on the set on the day and then realizing that you need to be somewhere else or you need to have some specialist crew or whatever. And let me show you an example of that. Take note of that image. We'll come back to it in a minute. This is my my uh, wonderful picture editor, Michael Whitty. He's become a very, very good friend of mine. We've been working together for, as I said, for nine years now. We've been all over the world together. Very important to get the client working for his money, guys. So uh, Michael's part of the team as well. He's not just sitting behind a, the wheel of a, of a big fancy car looking out. I'm, I always get him working. So here he is carrying the skis. You'll notice that he's carrying with him a roll of silver material. Now that is um, that is a boiler lagging material. We are in Norway here. Um, it wasn't particularly cold in their terms, but uh, with wind chill, it was minus 40. Now that's cold enough for me. Um, I uh, before we left, I researched it. Knew we were going to be going into a cold area. Battery packs don't like cold. You'll lose a lot of your power um, uh, by being in an area um, like that. Um, and so uh, I always take with me lagging material and we wrap the packs up in it. Uh, and it gives you up to 20% more uh, time on your battery packs. Really important because you don't want to be running out of power when you're there. Um, so that's my top tip for shooting in the Arctic. Um, uh, interestingly as well, I like this factor. Um, uh, the shot that you saw a moment ago was supposed to look like the Arctic. 
we need to make it look like the wild wastes that it is. But the next shot's going to tell you something that you didn't really realize. We're right next to a housing estate. We've got a motorway just behind me. We're not in the Arctic at all. We're in Norway. We're in a kind of a well-populated part of Norway. It's very snowy, but you know, it doesn't need to be where you are. So you don't need to put yourself in peril to get the image. One of the greatest things about using a camera is what it doesn't see. So what's just outside the frame is just as important sometimes as what's in the frame. You can see I'm using the uh, silver material also to kneel on because it keeps you warm as well as that. You can't see this very well, but it's actually wrapped around the pack just behind my right hand there, um, uh, which is keeping it nice and warm. You can see, goodness me, look at my lighting. I've got two front lights, and what's the back light? The sun. Um, in fact, actually, on this occasion, if I remember correctly, I snook a light behind her, um, which you'll see in a moment. I'll, I, I can't show you the light because I retouched it out. The light is actually, I put a light behind her to act as the sun because the sun wasn't playing ball with me that day. It was a very overcast, it was a very changeable kind of a day. Um, so I think you can see that a bit later on. Also, the light source to her right there behind her, but to the right of the image, is slightly harder than the soft source at the front, um, just to give a bit of edge and a bit of sparkle, because the snow tends to dull things down. You can see it there. If there's no hard sunshine, then it tends to be quite, quite bland. Um, but I'm now going to show you the thing that I was most pleased with of this shot. Before we went away, I looked at a lot of shots of uh, Cecily doing her real thing in the Arctic. She has, by the way, the, uh, an amazing world record. She has the, what's called the Three Peaks record, which means she's traveled from the North Pole to the top of Everest and then to the South Pole faster than anybody else. Um, just incredible feat. Um, I, I, I can't imagine what that must be like. Um, but I looked at the shots of her doing her trekking in the Arctic, and what tells you that they're actually in the Arctic is the frosting that they get on their beards, on their eyelashes. Of course, we didn't have that for real, so I made sure that I booked a makeup artist before I arrived in Norway, a special effects makeup artist, and I think that makeup artist made a massive difference to this shoot. Now, once again, had I just turned up on set and not done my research, then I wouldn't have been able to get that effect and the finished image wouldn't be anywhere near as convincing as it is. And it's those tips and tricks that make the difference. They really do. You can see there, if you look carefully, the uh, I've made it look as if the, the sun is bursting through the clouds. The sun actually wasn't bursting through the clouds at all. Um, I had a light directly behind her, punching straight into her back, which is why you get that lovely rim light around the, the right-hand glove there, and so on. But you can, if you're if you're particularly cl clever about it, you can see that the shadow from the from the um, uh, the uh, the sleigh that she's pulling, the sled she's pulling, is a little bit too wide for it to be the sun. It, it is actually from a from a false pack. Once again, I've done my thing there. What I what I always do on on these shoots, by the way, and it's a good tip, I think, in terms of if you're shooting like this, I always tell my assistant to remind me to do a background shot. So after I've done all my stuff with her, remember I'm shooting on tripod, I'll pull um, the person out of the shot entirely, I'll switch my autofocus off to manual focus so I don't re refocus by mistake, and then I'll shoot a background shot. I often shoot five frames so I can HDR the background, and then I'll shoot a sharp background shot in HDR as well, so I've got a selection of different background images that I can drop in should I wish to, so I can always drop it in at post-production. So. Um, yeah, I like that shot. I think it's a great bit of work. I'm very proud of it. So moving on from the cold wastes of Norway, believe it or not, we're going back to Austria. I don't believe the amount of shots I've done in Austria. This is very, very new, guys. Um, I shot this last year. This hasn't actually been released in the book yet. I had to get special permission to show you this today. Excuse me, some, some water. Um, I... I've actually just run this as a, as a mailer um, around the ad agencies. I had to get special uh, permission to do that because this has not been released yet. This is an amazing man, young Joseph. He is a stunt man and he has two world records, one of which is the longest standing burn. Uh, I think it kind of speaks for itself. This is remarkably not that retouched, smooth or not. Those are the real flames. And that's how big they were and, and how they actually look. Which brings me to a point which I think is kind of quite important, which is that my relationship with Guinness is, is long and uh, I've been with them for a while. 
and as such, we've built up our understanding along the way. When I use um, post-production effects, I'm not allowed to exaggerate. I'm not allowed to change the essence of the image at all, and they're very strict on that. Um, it obviously wouldn't be fair if I made this guy look as if he was the flames were leaping everywhere and he was like exploding into a million pieces. It wouldn't be fair if I made somebody look more athletic than they were. It wouldn't be fair if I made the tower on the, the guy with the, uh, the padding pool lip like 20 foot higher than it was. So I'm not allowed to do that. What I am allowed to do is to enhance the image and to give it a flavor of what I, I saw on the day. And we all know that isn't necessarily what what the photograph will do. Um, so once again, the background there is an HDR image that I shot after he'd left the frame. And then I dropped it in and keyed it in uh, just to add some flavor to it. Um, interestingly, around his feet, um, I've actually added a slight warm glow, which is what the flames would have given you. I, as you probably can tell, I've lit him from uh, the right-hand side and the left-hand side there with two lights. Um, the light on the left-hand side has a warm filter on it, so it looks as if the flames are creating that, but of course, as a flash, it would be a lot stronger than the flames themselves. And then on the right-hand side, I wanted to give a, a kind of a, quite a, a, a mean, um, almost like um, psycho killer kind of feel to it. And uh, I think it's a very strong image. I'm very proud of this shot. I'm using it as one of my main feature mailers this year. But this isn't the only record that uh, Joseph has, bless his heart. Um, uh, this is a close-up I did of him uh, later on, by the way. These are the gels that he puts on. He puts a, a fire-resistant gel on his skin because he's a perfectionist. He won't do it with a mask on and he won't do it with gloves on. Um, so he puts a fire-resistant gel, gel on his skin and then a, a fire gel on his clothes. Um, but I tell you, it's not something I'd fancy doing in a hurry. We have got safety guys there. We've got a, a, a fire crew. Um, but one of the most extraordinary things, one of the things I love about Austria is that they don't care. They'll do anything, anywhere. We're in a public park. Can you imagine setting somebody on fire in the middle of a public park in the UK? Um, I, I, I just can't imagine doing that. But Austria's a great country. They, they just have this great attitude to everything. Um, so a little bit of video. By the way, Jay tells me that video doesn't show too well. Um, uh, through the webinar, so I'm, but I'm going to try this. I hope it works well, guys. Um, but I want to show you how this works. I'm not kidding. This is a park. Look, you can see there's people standing around, and this is his other record. He has the longest burning pull behind a horse in the world. These records are not just randomly selected, by the way. That is a recognised stunt, which is very well sought after in the around the world. This guy uh, works in Hollywood quite a lot. Um, and he's a wonderful mad Austrian. <laughs> I'd have to say, I've never met an Austrian on this shit show that I, hasn't, that I haven't loved. They're great, great people. But one of the reasons I like this video as well, as well as showing the setup that we have there, um, is that I think it shows the power of the, of the still image. I, I do a little bit of video, but I'm still primarily a, a stills photographer, and I love my stills ph photography. Look at the power of what you saw there in that video, and then check this out. I think that has a greater impact. I just think it's a bigger, better, punchier image. Um, uh, and I, I think it tells the story better. Um, you probably noticed we do have a video crew with us sometimes, not always, but increasingly now we have a video crew and they do interviews with the record holders as well and they do sometimes interviews with me and part of them is behind the scenes and whatever. But I genuinely feel that the, the still images are more powerful. But um, Hey, you know, I guess we all have a different way of viewing it, but that's my feeling. Uh, okay, next. This is back home in Wales. Um, you may or may not be aware, but every year there is a bog snorkeling world championships in Wales. Uh, it's now become world famous. They have film crews from all over the globe that come to film it. Um, and it's now become part of the Guinness World Record. Uh, thing that um, uh, I have bog snorkeling, world, bog snorkeling world records. So I was tasked to go and get these world champions. And this is Natalie Bent. This is a great story because Natalie and her brother Danny are joint world record holders. She holds the bog snorkeling women's record. He holds the, 
the, the bog snorkeling triathlon record. You're going to see some shots of him in a minute. But just to show you that I am prepared to get stuck in, I'm not proud. That's me. Uh, our wonderful bit of pre-production on this one was that was that Michael, the picture editor, said we must buy galoshes, these waterproof galoshes. So he, of course, being Michael, he managed to get them from Amazon. He got the cheapest galoshes he could get. They lasted about 20 minutes before I, they started leaking, and I was absolutely drenched. Um, the rain that you saw earlier was real. It did rain on the day. It rained extensively, I can assure you. Um, and we shot in the rain. Um, I've done that several times before. We need to protect the packs, protect me, um, just to make sure we don't get damage. Um, but I, of course, I enhanced the rain. It wasn't all completely real. Uh, I laid it on and then I enhanced it hugely. Um, but uh, I like these shots a lot because they, they want, you can see it's kind of a bright sunny day for the most part. It got a little bit overcast, but I added a bit of atmosphere in there by creating these beautiful uh, lighting scenes. This is her brother Danny. Um, uh, and again, I've taken the I've taken the background shot separately, and we've dropped it in, and we've worked it forward. So we're not falsifying the record, but we're enhancing it and making it more dramatic than uh, than it is in real life. <clears throat> so uh, moving on to the next, let's have a look. Ah, the wonderful, wonderful John Lynch, A.K.A. Prince Albert. If you don't know why he's called Prince Albert, then you really should look that up on the internet. I'm not going to discuss it, but I'm sure that somebody will inform you what that means. Uh, it refers to a famous piercing. So <laughs> I will let you wear that one out. I am proud to say that I discovered Prince Albert, bless his heart. He is an ex-bank clerk. He's now in his 80s. And I did a, a calendar, a, a self-promotion calendar um, uh, quite a few years ago now, which I called Smile, and it was simply very close-up images of very bizarre and unusual and beautiful people uh, smiling at the camera. Um, I did lots of tattooed people, lots of pierced people, weird punks, weird um, odd people, um, and it was great fun. We had a big launch party in central London, and uh, um, it was a great success. But along the way, I was in Camden, uh, one day, and I spotted this guy walking around. So I approached him and said, "Look, I want to come. I want you to come to my studio for some. Uh, let me do some pictures of you." He's a lovely man. He turned up. We did some pictures, and then I thought, mm, "He's probably got a record." So I took him to the Guinness World Record offices, and I'm proud to say that he walked in and dropped his trousers, <laughs> and somebody had to count every single piercing on his body. Great man, wonderful man. Interestingly, I think he has 241 piercings, although they change. He tells me that he wakes up in the morning and there's, there's various different piercings, rings lying in his bed. He's not quite sure where they've come from. Uh, but he's not the most pierced person in the world. That accolade goes to a woman. Her name is Elaine Davidson. She's from South America, but she lives in Scotland. And she has up to 9,000 piercings. Nobody's ever counted them because, in her own words, most of them are inside me, darling, is what she says, <laughs> which is quite worrying. Um, she, in fact, uh, at one point actually got together with um, with John, which is quite amusing. They lived together for about a year or so. But um, so we photographed them together. I got them in the studio as well as outdoors, and uh, two quite extraordinary individuals. Um, but she left John. Um, and um, at this time, when I was photographing it, sometime after she, they they parted, because she was married, um, and uh, I have some proof of that. She married a wonderful ex-civil servant called Douglas Watson in 2011. What a wonderful, wonderful marriage! <laughs> There's no accounting for taste. Lovely lady. Okay, uh, that's not my shot, by the way. I just thought I'd tell you that. <coughs> This is an extraordinary man. I uh, photographed him before last. Tamaru Zagai is based in Germany, uh, but grew up in Africa. Very, very, very humbling photo shoot this. Uh, he was born without the use of his legs. In fact, his legs were wrapped like a corkscrew under his body when he was born. For the first seven years of his life, he all he could do was shuffle along the ground. Um, then, uh, via a charity, um, some doctors got to work on him, 
Uh, he's had over the years over 40 different um, operations and gradually they unwrapped his legs and gave him some mobility uh, to move in them. But while he was a kid, he was given his first set of uh, crutches. And of course, like every child, he wants to play. So he learned to lift himself up and swing up. Uh, as his legs were slowly um, uh, developing, he learned to do this beautiful thing where he curls his legs over the top of his body uh, like a scorpion. And I just think these shots are beautiful. They're an amazing testament to the fact that out of something so awful comes this very beautiful thing. It doesn't, it doesn't look weird or horrible or odd. It just looks athletic and beautiful. And um, it's one of my favorite shoots on that basis. And look at what you can see there. I haven't used backlight. Um, I didn't use backlight because um, I really loved the sky in this shot. And that's not a falsified sky. Um, I was keen to get my polarizing filter out. Um, and that's what I did. Uh, it, we used a bit of backlight. I, there is a, a, a power pack in there in the far right. Just It's actually in the image, but I retouched it out um, just to give him that key light face. And it kicks across, and then I've got a softbox on the left-hand side just to pick up on the edge of the, um, uh, of the crutches there just to give it some kind of personality and some, some real kick to it. But um, I think it's a really lovely shot and amazing, amazing man. I love the power and the image of it. This was also, by the way, I, I um, one of the uh, occasions where I used a little bit of hypersyncing, which I'm, I use increasingly now for, for movement. Um, Hypersyncing, um, in fact, I tried out recently the new um, Elinchrom um, system, which is their um, HS system, absolutely incredible. You don't need to go back to your laptop anymore and reprogram the, the unit. You can just do it all on camera, dial it up. It is the best system available. I love it. Uh, and we um, have used it quite a lot. I use it on a, on a shoot. In fact, I haven't got the shots here, but a shot that I did just before Christmas for Guinness of a guy who does football tricks. Um, and it was incredible, absolutely incredible. Uh, okay, so moving on. This gentleman was photographed in, uh, in Toronto. Sawan Singh, um, he's a Sikh, I think he's a Sikh priest. Um, he, has a, he has a following there. Uh, and this shot took a long time to do because he has uh, the world record for the longest beard. My assistant is just off frame left there, and he was tasked with flicking his beard. So someone had to sit there. It's quite a, um, a testimony to him because he, he does quite a lot of um, um, uh, spiritual stuff. So he's used to sitting uh, for long periods of time, being calm and being peaceful. So I popped him on the edge of the, uh, this big concrete block which we found near the Toronto Tower and my assistant was tasked with flicking his beard. Remember I mentioned earlier about the retouching thing, the post-production, that I'm not allowed to falsify it. So I had to make sure that when I, because obviously I, I, I manipulated the beard to make it absolutely perfect, um, but uh, I couldn't lengthen it. So I had to make sure that we had to do all the maths to make sure that the length wasn't too long and so on. And then I did the shadows in on the bricks there just to give it a little bit of flavor and a little bit of texture. Um, so um, yeah, longest beard shot, lots of fun. So of course, the tallest man in the world is always a big, big thing. And I was called up uh, a few years ago um, when they discovered a new tallest man, Sultan, who was discovered on a, an island in Turkey. Um, we had a big, big meeting about this. It's quite a big deal because it's a massive uh, record. It's very popular with the 11-year-old boys who are our target market for the book. Um, <coughs> Sultan uh, has a, a growth hormone issue. And in fact, Guinness have been amazing. In fact, they sponsored him, looked after him. Had he been left in his island in Turkey, he probably would be dead by now because he, uh, he would grow out of control. But they are giving him treatment. They also shipped him around the world. The day after he did this, he uh, went to open up, uh, he was on the Jay Leno show, and then he went to open up a, um, a massive basketball game, which was quite fun. 
but I had I, I kind of set this up because I'd been shooting in New York uh, a couple of years before, and I found a spot that I always wanted to shoot from, where you could see really clear image of the Empire State Building, as you can see back there. So I thought, great, we can get him in there, and obviously it's kind of quite ironic that he can stand next to, he can be taller than the Empire State Building. Um, the policeman there is a real um, NYPD guy. We rang them up. We said we need some help. They came along. They cordoned off the whole road there. There was about 300 people gathered around us. You can't see them there, but they did gather around. Uh, we're right. If any of you know New York, then on the left-hand side is the Flatiron Building, which is the spot where we were. Um, uh, I also did the classic thing that every photographer dreads doing, which having told my assistants to be careful and to be safe, I then tripped over my Alincron power pack and smacked the light into the ground and it blew up and I got a round of applause from the 300 people that were there, <laughs> so I felt like a complete idiot. Um, we did this shot, I have a producer that I work with in, in New York, it sounds very grand, but it's it basically they're a stylist, they're a fixer. Um, uh, and I rang up Jake and said, Jake, I want to get him on a basketball court somewhere. So um, he, uh, we parted him into a vehicle after this, and then Jake organized a basketball court just downtown, a, little, a few blocks away from here. So we turned up at this basketball court, and all the kids went absolutely mental, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, uh, this is me standing next to him. I'm six foot two, so you can see, and he's hunched over, by the way. His hands are just enormous as well. Uh, but he's a very sweet, very kind man, um, and I liked meeting him very much. And I think what Guinness has done for him is a one, it's a great symbiotic relationship. It works very, very well. Okay, this was one of the earliest shots I did for my friends at Guinness. This was on the very first trip that I did. That trip I spoke to you about in 2007, uh, where we travelled across the states. We did about 50, 16 images on that basis. Let me talk you through actually how. That works because it's kind of quite an interesting thing. What will happen is the picture editor Michael uh, will come up with a short list of images that he wants to get in a given area, and then we'll work out a shoot list from that point of view. He'll contact me at that point and say, "Okay, I've got a whole bunch of of people that um, I think we can shoot." He will have contacted most of them on the basis of of uh, a probability, not a definite, at that point. And then he and I will get together for a meeting, a pre-production meeting, and he will ask me, what do you want to do, really? Um, one of the reasons I love working for Guinness is because I get such an amazing amount of creative freedom. Um, with that, of course, comes a huge level of responsibility to get the image, but it's just like doing paid tests, really. Um, the payoff for them is not great on the basis that they don't pay brilliantly, they don't pay full advertising rates and so on. And the other side of it is, I'm sorry to say, that they uh, they keep rights to the images, and that's, I know that's a big contentious issue. Um, I've been criticised for that in the past, and I think in some ways quite rightly so. But you have a, you run a business, you make a business decision, and my decision was they need the rights. They're upfront about it. They can't keep coming back to me and buying more rights for different territories around the world and so on. They've got to have the rights. It's important to what they do. It's too extensive. Uh, but I'm doing paid tests for them. They give me such an amazing access to all these guys. Um, and they're very, very good in allowing me to use the images wherever I want, and that's fabulous. So um, I, I'm happy. I get paid a good rate per image. Uh, but I don't get any residuals, uh, <clears throat> so it's not the same as an advertising shoot on that basis. But uh, this was a, an interesting shot. We turned up there. This is the biggest monster truck in the world. It's now on display, and just to the right here is a huge, great big shop uh, and cafe devoted to Bigfoot. It's got a big star there. Um, this is the kind of shot that I normally dread because you turn up there, it's all fenced in. You've got nothing you can do with it, really. And then this little boy turned up, and he was actually wearing a Man United shirt, which was quite bizarre. Um, uh, so we grabbed him quickly, bought him a toy, <laughs> and said, stand there and look amazed. <laughs> so he just stood there and went, wow, uh, with a little truck next to him, and, uh, and the shot lives on what it is. Obviously, just, I think you probably have guessed by now that that flag was not in full flight. The flag was on the, the vehicle, but it wasn't actually in that perfect uh, 
blown state on that shot, but I shot lots and lots of images and I got a flag that's perfect and a car that's perfect, a vehicle that's perfect and a little boy that's perfect and a little truck that's perfect. And then I dropped them all together. And so I did my post production bit. <clears throat> Some of the other vehicles I photographed are equally as impressive. This is a trip we did to Italy. Uh, this is one of the European trips we often go to Europe and travel through two or three different countries. Uh, this was in uh, Modena in Italy. I'm a massive motorbike fan. Anybody that knows me will tell you that I'm mad about motorbikes. I do a lot of track days. I've got quite a large collection of motorbikes. I've got race bikes and scooters and Harleys and all sorts of stuff. So I was really, really keen to do this image. Um, this is one of those records that you just think, wow. Um, it was totally amazing when you get there and see this thing. It's a beast. He controls it with a, uh, a little a, um, uh, um, joystick on the saddle there. And actually, again, some lighting tricks here, lighting trickery. I've got two heads behind the motorbike there, um, uh, one of which um, is just behind the front wheel to the background and the other which is just behind him. And all I've done is then done the shots to get the dramatic backlight that I wanted because the sun wasn't quite powerful enough for me. Um, uh, and then I've retouched the lights out because why can't, why, why shouldn't I? I can, so why not? Um, again, my familiar three light setup, I've got a one big softbox head standing by me uh, to punch into the front there. You can see the reflections of it if you look carefully. Um, and two backlights behind. And it all works well. Um, this isn't my favourite shot, though, in this sequence because I really like this shot we did indoors, which I think is more impressive. Actually, I just think it's more fun. The previous shot was the shot that we planned to do. This was the shot that when we get there, we have to bend and twist and develop what we do as we go along. And the workshop was so impressive. I loved it, and I loved the fact it looked bigger. I think inside the workshop than it did outside the workshop. To the right there in the foreground, you'll see this enormous Harley which looks like a little toy by comparison to it. And I shot this with a person in there using HDR techniques um, to give it that lovely kind of crisp, sharp feel from front to back and that kind of otherworldly quality to it. Um, and uh, I think it works well. Of course, he's propped up because he can't move because you're doing a five-step, five-stop um, HDR image, so he has to stay where he is. Richard, I didn't want uh, you this, to. Sorry, Richard, I didn't want you to think that I, I wasn't here, but I know we still have quite a few <laughs> images to. Uh, Has everybody yeah. gone? No, no, they haven't gone. Mate. Uh, but I wanted to make you aware that I was here, but we've still got quite a lot. I know from that you want to share with people, um, but a lot of them have. You've been going, so I didn't want you to think that you're there on your own. You're not, but I do want you to you know there's a couple of sequences that you're going to explain. Uh, the workings with, which I think is really important that we share with the audience. So, guys, stay with us because I know we're already at eight o'clock, but uh, obviously we'll. we'll I can't we'll... believe it. The yeah. <laughs> gone, isn't it? I've got a lot more images to show. I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to speed up, guys. I'm, uh, forgive me, but I'm going to have to shoot through this a bit because those are going to get nowhere. I'm, I'm only about halfway through. We're going to be here till midnight. So, uh, and I know that um, uh, I'm sure you guys have got other things to do. Your partners will be killing me <laughs> if you are not back home at some point. Um, I'm going to launch straight into this. I like this sequence because I think it's really important. I'm going to skip over that. I had a little video bit. I'm going to skip over the video bit. So blah, blah, blah. Anyway, okay. So this is a good example of everything that I've spoken about so far. I was tasked to do this image. This guy's a world rowing guy. He's done, uh, he's got, um, he's rowed more oceans than anybody else in the world. Incredible man. And they said, okay, we want to get you to shoot him out at sea um, with the dramatic, with all the drama that brings with it. Of course, as a, this is the classic thing a client will say. As a photographer, of course, you instantly know that's not going to happen because I want to get good lighting in there. I want it to, to be controllable. Like I, I knew I'd be dancing around the ocean forever to get a shot like this. I'd never get it. So we went to Cornwall where the guy is based. And uh, I had an idea. And I'll show you what we did. Check it out. So this is my little video thing. This is us um, working our way to the beach. Um, I'm going to have to let it run because I need you to see this. So we dragged the boat onto the beach. By the way, we turned up the night before, day before, and we contacted the local council to get permission to do this on the beach. Um, uh, there we go. One, two, three. Here's our waves coming in now. Go on, guys. Do that thing. Go on. Bang. And that's what we did.
and we did that a dozen times, we did it two dozen times, we did it a hundred times until we had the waves that I wanted. So we ended up with this shot. But of course he's not in the water, he's on the beach, it's all up on the beach. So I'm going to show you the whole sequence of the retouch that we did, the post-production that I did afterwards. So here we go. That was the initial shot, my first base shot. It's got most things in there, but you can see that it's on the beach there. It's actually a pretty good uh, image as regards to the water levels in there. Lots of backlight. Whenever you photograph in water splashes, guys, you need lots and lots of backlight because it's all about highlights. So let me show you fairly quickly as we go through. This is the next image coming in. Ooh, water. So I went behind, I shot the, the ocean for real, including a few waves. I then just dropped it in, but we've still got the front prow of the boat there, it's still looking all clamped up. So we have to do something about that. So we got another image of the splashes. I got the guys to run around the boat and do splashes from every side, so we had plenty of options. Layering it up, um, even more splashes now, just getting them more more and more layers of them, more and more vitality, more and more movement. I think this is the way we bring his facing, because of course you can't see his face at the moment. So I did several different shots. Oh, it's not, I'm wrong, sorry. This was the, the waves around the front. Let me just see. That was the, the, the front ocean. See that there? The front of the boat there, just a little bit more spray. Um, next image, that's his face. There he goes. So I pulled his face in there without making it look false, because you've got to be able to see the guy. It's a, it is a portrait at the end of the day. It's quite important from that point of view. So I then really laid some, some density into the water and gave a nice sharp feel to it as it comes around the bottom of the bay. If you look that back there, you can see where I've done that. A, I've layered in some more water and B, I've also just brightened it up and given a little bit a little bit brighter feel to it all. Next image is what I call my uh, grain and sharp, which gives it that, it's an action that I've designed in Photoshop, which gives me a, a much more grainy feel and brings it back into the photographic world. I think that digital images tend to look a bit sterile, so I add grain to them and then I sharpen the grain and then add a little bit of black in there, just gives it a little bit more punchy feel to it. So uh, we started off with that, uh, which is where we were, and we ended up with that and I think the difference is incredible um, and of course they were thrilled to bits because they what they got their, their boat out at sea. <clears throat> so on from the virgin boat to two dogs. This is another shot where we went uh, to the location for one image. We flew all the way to the States to do one shot and then flew all the way back again. It's in Sacramento. The reason we did it that way is because the two dogs happened to be in town at that time. They live in different parts of the States, but they'd never been fully up together before and they happened to be in Sacramento for a dog show. So we hit them at the same time. Uh, I it was a difficult shot to do this. Working with animals is very difficult, and animals are a very important part of the Guinness World Records thing. But a fabulous day. I really enjoyed it. The funny thing is, is that uh, Gibson, who's the big Great Dane, almost stepped on Boo Boo, who's the tiny dog, and we all said, wow, imagine the PR of that, that whilst getting them together for their first photo shoot, we actually managed to kill the smallest dog in the world. <laughs> well, we didn't. He did survive. So... Um, all was well. And this, of course, Sacramento, by the way, that isn't the White House, but it kind of looks a bit like the White House. It's called the White House in Sacramento, uh, and it was designed by the same architect. So it gives a feel for everybody around the world that this is America. Um, on another trip to the States, there's a different trip. I was privileged to meet Colo in Columbus Zoo. In Columbus Zoo, they have two different world records, one of which was the longest snake in the world. He's now dead, I'm afraid. Uh, but the longest python in the world was about 28 feet. It was unbelievable. Um, I did that shot, but it was a fairly dull shot, really, because you can't do a lot with the snake. I sat for three hours, though, with Colo in his pen. Um, obviously, I was behind bars, <laughs> but I love this shot. It's a simple, simple image, uh, but I think it has so much personality, so much humanity about it. Um, and uh, I'm proud to say I won an award uh, at the SWPPs for this image, um, and I love it. I adore it. Um, it's a great shot. Uh, it's also worth saying, by the way, that another reason to, for me to shoot Guinness, even though the money isn't great, is that I I've got more portfolio pieces and won more awards for my Guinness work than any other client I've ever had. So, um, you know, it pays off. It pays off. 
this was from my trip last year again, and these are all brand new shots, so um, you're the, some of the first people to see these. This is the goat with the longest horns in the world, and my idea for this shot was that having been to Austria on many occasions, I knew that we had this kind of big, beautiful rural scene, so I, I contacted the, or the, I got the book to contact the owner and say, get some traditional dress, and I based this on uh, early um, uh, um, uh, rural uh, oil paintings. I wanted it to look like a like a beautiful old oil painting, and that's the feel that I wanted to get with it. His girlfriend was in the background there in a traditional dress as well, um, and uh, I think it's really effective. Uh, um, I did several other shots of the goat as well, one in his pen, one in the, in the middle of a forest, and they're interesting too, but I think this shot works extremely well um, and has that lovely sort of painterly quality to it, and of course it's layered up, and of course it's using, I like to mix this HDR effect, as you can probably see, it gives a great drama to the images. Smallest horse in the world, Thumbelina, uh, turned up on set. Um, in St. Louis, and this is the grandson of the owner of the horse, and he, he was all dressed up and ready to go, it was just an easy shot to do. Uh, but to make it special, we shipped in from Texas, the biggest horse in the world as well. So this is laser, uh, and uh, so radar, um, and uh, radar turned up as well, and uh, I can tell you I could literally walk under the horse by dipping my head just dip my head and I could walk directly under the horse. Incredible. Quite an amazing, amazing thing to see. Now when it comes to animal shots, one of my favorites was this. This is Charles and Tristan who have the Panto Horse 100 meters record. I think the record's something like about 11 and a half seconds. It's an incredible record. These guys are completely insane. Um, and we photographed them at Lingfield Racecourse. On the day I had um, just uh, we had two different pantomime horse setups, uh, and we simply doubled them up and shot it all over it. So all these are just these are just two horses. Twelve and a half seconds, in fact. Sorry, is the record. Uh, so I shot many, many shots of the same horses in different parts of the race course. I locked the camera off on the fencing that you can see there. And then I went back to the race course two weeks later when they had a real race on, and I shot the crowd. Um, so I could drop in a real crowd, and that's how that shot was created. It's all, all the wonderful, wonderful world of Photoshop, and it worked very well. <clears throat> okay. So this is again, I'm showing a bit of trickery now. This was um, Alan Bate, who has the around the world cycling record. He, he circumnavigated the world faster than anybody else on a bicycle. Um, he was also based in Cornwall. Um, but uh, and the idea that Michael, the picture editor, had there was to shoot him on a cliff top in Cornwall, which I thought was interesting. But the moment he mentioned Cornwall, I came up with the idea of the Eden Project. I don't know if any of you have been to the Eden Project, but this is a, a Vietnamese hut that they have there. All I'm required to do is to retouch out the, the bars out of the, the roof struts there. And of course, he now looks like he's in uh, is in Vietnam, which gives it a much greater, more international kind of feel about, feel about it. I then photographed him at night. No, I didn't. I just over lit it. Um, uh, uh, if you use, I don't know if you've used that technique before, but if you use the flash on quite a strong setting and turn down your shutter speed, um, uh, shoot, sorry, shoot up your shutter speed, make sure that the balance is right, you can make it look like it's night time and then I just retouched the light in his head at the later stages. So, um, yeah, so that has, that's how to get a guy to be in Vietnam when he's actually in Cornwall. <coughs> Once again, uh, lots of clever jewelry pokery. Sebastian Bosch came over from uh, Belgium, I believe, actually, um, uh, to Teddington. We pre-organized a um, fairground that we're setting up there. They'd set up already, and they're going to be opening in the next following, sorry, the following day. Um, I just locked my camera off, photographed him in several different places. His record is he, he has a marathon, uh, a bumper car marathon record. He, he did it for four days, it was ridiculous. Um, I wired up his tie, so you can see his tie looks like it's flicking in the wind there, and we had a, a wind machine to blow his hair back. And then I simply placed him all over the the um, uh, the court in different places. I could position him piece by piece, so he so he's not obscuring himself. Uh, and then I added lots of movement to it. Um, added lots of the lights were on on the 
um, the bumper cars, but all the flair and so on. I think it adds to the drama and feel of it. Um, uh, it wasn't shot at night, so I shot a nighttime scene and then dropped it in the background there. Okay. This was a fun one. Uh, this was in Germany. We turn up in the village, in, in the little village of Starzak. This man ha has <coughs> his own museum. Uh, he has the world record for the most, most amount of masks. Masks. If I'm northern, I'll say masks. If I'm southern, I say because I live in London now, I now say masks. Um, but um, uh, I was struck immediately by how odd this town was. It was very clean and very perfect and very wonderful. And they're just very too beautiful, and it reminded me of those kind of weird old uh, Hammer House of Horror movies where you turn up at a village and it's like the village of the damned. So we immediately said, "Okay, let's let's take it over." So we we set about his two daughters set about ringing up everybody in the town, and we managed to get hold of a tractor, a bicycle, a motorbike, a car, um, a picnic scene. Um, all the different bits that you see around there are all different people that turned up for us on the day, spontaneously. We hadn't organized it before, um, and we got every one of them to wear a mask. Uh, I then later shot the microlight flying above and then dropped a mask onto them as well. Uh, and we put the shot together, and I think it has a lovely feel to it, and turns what would have been really genuinely a pretty boring record into something that looks kind of strange and bizarre and real. And I'm telling a story which is what my brief is to do on all occasions. This um, image was used right across the world as a big starring image for Guinness and was really successful for them. <coughs> okay, so we're coming near the end now, um, So, which is all good stuff. This was shot last year as well. I had a fantastic year last year. I really think I shot probably the best stuff I've ever done for them. This is an amazing record. It's called a monowheel, and these guys built this monowheel up in Lincolnshire. Um, it's the fastest monowheel in the world, and again, one, I'm going to show you one of these sequence things. Uh, I looked at the video of it beforehand. I know a little bit about motorbikes and machines, and I knew that when this thing runs, it, uh, it the engine is designed to swing forward to give it some weight. So I knew I wasn't going to be able to shoot it moving because it would move too quickly, and it wouldn't have enough control over it. Even with hypersyncing, we wouldn't have enough control. So I got them to build me a rig to hold it. So we did several different shots. I'll show you that in a second. I'm going to come back to that. So this is image number one, which I thought was lovely. We then did this image as well, which is designed um, to think, if you think about layouts on a page, that sky there can be full of copy, full of dropped in images and so on. So you have to think about what the editor is going to use the images for, and it's quite important from that point of view. So we did this shot here. Uh, the leaves we dropped in afterwards, I had a big crew of people throwing lots of leaves. One of my second assistants all day, all she did was pick up leaves and put them into bags and then throw them. Um, but the star image was this one which is fun, and I'm going to show you how we did it, <coughs> again, piece by piece. Um, uh, we, in fact, I took the, uh, the extreme example of my backlighting technique on this occasion. We had a light on the floor directly behind the machine there, but I'm going to show you it uh, piece by piece so you can see how it was all set up. This is my opening image. You see, I got my engineers. I knew they were an engineering crew, so I said to them before I left, before I got there, that I wanted them to build me a little piece they could screw on, and they bolted it onto the front of the of the bike there. That engine would sit on the ground if it wasn't held up by that piece, and so that obviously wouldn't be any good for us. So uh, they built this rig specially for us to do the shoot. Um, so that's the opening shot. Um, I always like to try and get as much as I can, as I said before, in my um, images for real. So those leaves you see there, they're really there. That was part of that image. That's one of our three. I've got two guys standing to the, out of camera to the right there. Both of them are throwing leaves, sometimes further back, sometimes further forward. So we've got lots of variety and lots of variation. So I'm going to show you the first retouch image. There we go. We've lost the, we've lost the, um, uh, the stand there. And I did an HDR image of the engine. And if you notice, let me just show you quickly. Look at the engine there. How dull and boring. Oh, well, oh, horrible. Dull, boring. Move the lights around. HDR it. Bang. Look at that. Lovely. All that detail in the engine. Absolutely beautiful. And you can see my light behind it. Let me show you something else, by the way. You see that cable coming out um, just by the front of the wheel there. That's the cable that's going in to the light which is sitting on the ground behind them. But it created a, um, a lovely backlight effect, but I wasn't too happy with the highlight, so I got the highlight changed. You see that there? I've just retouched it so the shadow is, 
is nice and clean and, and funky. HDR the background in, look at that, absolutely beautiful background, looks wonderful, looks very sweet. Um, <coughs> next up, uh, what happened then? See that? Oh, I know, I spun the wheel. Look at the wheel, look at the tyre, I'm going back, now look at the tyre spinning. So it gives that sense of movement, that punching around the wheel, just spinning it around there. Um, then uh, I've added movement to the background, just to give the, the whole thing a little punchy feel, a little movement feel, a little juddery feel. Not too much, just enough to make it work. Lots more leaves in there. There's about five layers of leaves in there, and then doubled up and reworked. And, and, the, and some of them are even on the floor. Um, I'm going to flick back again. Look at the ones on the floor. So you'll see them on the floor there as well. So they're all <coughs> put in there very, very um, intensely and in the right positions. Um, I blackened off the visor and just gave her, a, gave him a good old clean overall. But just darkening off the visor just gives it that that feeling of aggression, that lovely kind of high techy um, feel to it. I wanted it to look a little bit Mad Max. This the location, by the way, was just amazing. It was uh, um, down the road from where the guy lived in Lincolnshire. I'm from Lincolnshire. I, I lived in Lincolnshire. Um, my mother, in fact, lives about about five miles down the road from this place. But I didn't know it was there. It's an old disused factory building. And the guy sent me some pictures of it. I thought, wow, amazing. So, you know, if you ask the right questions, you get the right answers. So they found the location for me. Um, of course, my final bit is to put in my grain and sharp. So you can see that kind of darkness and richness that comes in there. And a little bit of grain to give it a bit of grittiness, a bit of wonderfulness in there. Okay. Um, that is the original shot. Going back again, I think it's always nice to see it. And then from that, we went to that quite a massive difference I think and uh, a fabulous shot I love it I hope you like it too um, now this is my final frame guys because uh, a few years ago we were doing a trip in Europe we were driving across Europe in that way like we do I spent a lot of time on the road and I said hey I want to I want to break a record so I got Michael to send me a list of all the most breakable world records there were and my favorite was the tallest stack of poppadoms. That's my assistant, Chris, and my two children, Camille and Marley. Uh, and uh, we broke the world record for the tallest stack of poppadoms, 1 meter 42. Amazing. We raised money for the Indian flood relief and uh, had a lot of fun. So I'm a world record holder too. Not too bad. Thank you very much indeed, guys. Um, I hope you're still all there. I know I've gone a little bit beyond my timing. Um, but uh, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Well, thank you very much. Mate, I thoroughly enjoyed it, so thank you very much. And I was privy to some of it, but yes, m the m most of them have stayed with us, and there are uh, lots of thanks. <laughs> lots, most of them stay with, and lots of thanks coming through on the chat panel, um, which I'll right. share with you in a minute. I know you're on uh, taxi duty today, but we've only got a few questions because fortunately <laughs> you answered quite a lot as you went. What's the toughest assignment you've ever done? Oh my God, the toughest assignment. Um, I don't know, actually. I think, uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, I, I guess the toughest ones are the ones where you, where you fail. Uh, I'll tell you what, one of, the, one of the most, actually one of the most difficult actually was the bog snorkeling one. And I'll tell you why, because bless them, the lights did not work. They just wouldn't work. And you know, I can't blame them. We were in like knee deep mud and it was raining. Uh, and we managed to, to get them to work in the end by raising them off the ground. Um, so I did think at one point that was going to be a failure, if I'm being honest. But it ended up being one of the best shots I've ever done, I think. I think one of my favorite shots overall. So that was probably the toughest. It was also wet and horrible and cold and dirty and manky. But the Welsh were lovely, and we stayed in a lovely old pub, and we got very drunk that night. Excellent. Um, okay, so obviously you've mentioned that you use portable lighting, and I know that at the moment you favor the Allen Crop. Yeah. Do you ever just use revert back yeah. to speed lights, or do you favor the sort of the more powerful battery packs? Do you know what? Actually, um, I'm not going to try and be sort of groovy and as one with the people here. I've never done the speed light thing. Uh, I mean, I use them on camera. I've got, I've got, you know, I've got, a, I've got a couple of speed lights that I use on camera. Um, but I know a lot of guys use them off camera. I say I've never done that. Do you know what? That's a complete lie. Not only have I done it, I can't believe I said that. I, I did a shot of my daughter um, about two years ago, and I won a, a flipping. BIP peel award for it, so I did it with a with a um, with my um, 
my Canon 580 at the time. I've got a 600 now, but it's 580. Um, and and I, I needed an extra light, so I went to the local. I was I was in uh, Dorset, and I went to Exeter. I went to Jessops, and I bought a a 12 pound 50 second hand flash gun and some little units that you could use to sync them with and I lit the whole thing with that and we shot in Mr. Blobby's old house in what used to be a theme park, uh, it used to be a Blobby World theme park um, which uh, I'd been given access to by a friend of mine and uh, I ca you can't imagine what that image looks like so I go to my website www.rbradbury.com look up the image of the girl in the weird house and that was shot all with speed lights so yes I remembered I did <laughs> Excellent. Um, this came through a couple of times actually right back when you were referring right back at the beginning to was it raw r-o-r yeah is it and yes, everybody yes, asked yes. what was the fourth one again so we got uh research response. organized action response, response. Okay. Brilliant. okay i'll get through you really quickly um i do a massive seminar on it and i've got a big thing and blah 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 and do you know what i want to speak to the academy guys about this because i think we could do something together it'd be really good fun um uh Raw, it's a great thing to remember, write it down, research, so research your market, make sure you know who you're selling to, don't think you know because you're probably wrong, make sure you research it, make sure you know it, it doesn't matter if you're shooting portraits of children or if you're shooting high-end advertising, you need to know who you're selling to, so research first. Organize your research, so in other words, once you've done your research, then get back, organize what you're going to do, what does it mean? Um, what's the best way to talk to these people? What's the best way to get to them? And then, if you need to talk to them in a certain way, let's say you want to do a, an emailer, then you need to get on. You need to get organised with listings. Um, you need to get organised with a, an email device, a sender of some sort. Um, and then action, 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 action is the most important part of it. It's the bit where most people fail. Action means do it. Actually, go and do it. Don't just talk about it down the pub. You've got to, if you want to get some work, you've got to actually go out there and knock on doors. You've got to send mailers out. You've got to speak to people on the phone. You've got to work hard. It's hard, hard work, and you've got to go and do it. Action is the most important thing of all. Finally, the final R is response. Response is really important. And I mean the response in several different ways. Firstly, the direct response that you give to the people when they call you up. So when you speak to them on the phone, know what you're talking about. Be ready to speak to them. Get your studio ready to get to get the work done. There's no point in getting work and then realizing that you haven't got any lights to fulfill the brief with. Um, but secondly, the other part of response is to make sure that when you get the, the response that I guarantee you will get if you use this system, I absolutely guarantee it will work, that when you get that response, then log it and then use it, spin it round right to the front, back to the research part. So all the response that you've got from these people, you need to be logging, you need to work out what they've done, why they've come to you, where they've come from, who they are, and then work out who's similar to them, bring that response right, right back round to the research at the start and then start the whole process all over again. Is that Does that answer your question? Brilliant, mate. Yeah, and, and then some. And uh, you and I will definitely be Good. talking about working together. We we want to talk to you about that conversation. I want to talk to you about it. Brilliant. Um, okay. I really, I get so enthusiastic when I talk about marketing because it's I, I really think, and I know the academy feel the same as me. Which is why I I, I I really commend you guys for being a part of the academy. I think it's I, I, I'm not I don't work for them. I don't get paid by them. I think they're a great organisation, and I, I say that because. I think we share the same belief structure, which is that as a professional photographer, remember the word professional, as a professional photographer, 50% of what you do has to be business. You've got 50% of it is your ability as a photographer, the other 50% is business, and that means marketing and business ability. So you've got to, got to get the marketing right, otherwise you'll go nowhere. Well, thank you for that. But yes, we're, we're completely in sync with you on that, mate. Absolutely. Um, this was quite a nice question, and I, I, we, we do need to, 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 to ask it. So obviously, working with Guinness, there's a million uh, records in the book. Um, so who, who, who actually chooses uh, the images that you're going to photograph, or is it a joint effort between yourselves and the picture editor, or do you just get sent wherever you send? Yeah, it is. Uh, well, fundamentally, it's... A, it's one of the most interesting parts is fundamentally Michael is the picture editor. He gets together with uh, the guy I mentioned uh, um, uh, earlier, um, uh, Mr. Glenn Day, the editor, and they uh, put, it, put together a short list of, uh, of record holders. Then at that point, um, I will get called in at some point along the way um, because often I will, what we'll often find is that I will have a different vision for the shoot. 
I'll sit down with Michael, the picture editor, and he'll say, for instance, the the um, uh, the around the world cyclist. He's like, I've got this idea. For, we can be in Cornwall. We can do this shot on the on a cliff edge, and it'll be fantastic. And that that is a nice shot. It, it sounds interesting. But I I knew that I had this vision of doing the Eden project. Um, so I I would bring that to the table. Uh, on that occasion, he immediately just went, Wow, yes, we've got to do that. That's fabulous. Often though, we'll get a situation where he just doesn't agree with me. You know, he. He doesn't agree with me, and if he doesn't agree with me, then it's important for him to realise that he's wrong, <laughs> because <laughs> because I'll convince him that I'm right. Um, but no, it's normally it's it's a it's a, a collaboration between us. Um, but the, it's the most exciting part when we get the records in. I get this list that comes through to me, and we'll sit down and go. We did a thing recently where, for instance, a good example last year, I did the tallest, the largest chess piece in the world. Uh, a technical um, college in uh, Germany have just built this huge chess piece. It's about 20, 30 feet, 20, 30 feet high. Um, and Michael wanted to do a shot of it um, uh, with the guys standing, all the guys standing around it and, uh, and standing with ch holding chess boards to show the difference, the difference between it. I had an idea of doing it like uh, getting a, getting the guys that have built it, get one of the guys that have built it on a horse to make it look like he was the knight, actually really on a horse. So we did both. So we got a horse organised, we got the chess pieces organised, blah 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 blah. I think my shot looked, shot looked better, but I did his shot as well. On the, you know, we're using both, I'm sure. Uh, brilliant. This was quite an interesting question, but we are getting towards the end, mate. So you, you'll be all right. We're getting there. <laughs> um, given the nature. Sorry, I'll try and be quicker. With my, no, 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 you're fine. My answers. No, you're fine. It's all good, mate. Um, I know that it's you that's got to shoot off. So let's. Uh, we're, we're, we're getting there, though. Uh, given <laughs> my the daughter is going skiing. Can you believe that? So I'm going to drop her off to go skiing. I'm having a day off school to go skiing. Scary, isn't it? Brilliant. I love it. I wish I was. I've got another day in the office, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Um, given the nature of some of your shoots, with obviously regards to health and space, health and safety, does it impact, does it impact on your own photography insurance? Wow, God, that's a technical question. I don't know really. <laughs> I have uh, I have straightforward insurance. I've got I think five million pounds worth of of um, liability cover, which is the bit you want to worry about. You know, the bit which is like people in the general public that you drop your light on or something. Um, I'm very pleased to say that I've never used it. The only thing I've used my insurance for, actually weirdly enough, um, is that uh, I left a, uh, a Canon EOS 1 in a taxi cab in New York, uh, complete with lens, and I didn't get it back, got the police report, came back, uh, got the thing replaced, Wonderful, no problem at all. I replaced it with the same camera. Fantastic, wonderful. A uh, year, year and a half later, I was in New York again. I was in a taxi cab again, and guess what I did? I left the exact same camera in the exact same cab, not the same cab, but in a cab again. And I got back and reported it, and the insurance company said, nobody would be stupid enough to say that exactly the same thing happened again, so you must be telling the truth, so we'll, so we'll, we'll pay you the money for the camera, which I thought was quite amusing. But um, that's my only insurance thing. <laughs> There's nothing, nothing weird about my insurance. It's all the same stuff. Excellent. Uh, okay. Oh, well, the last one, actually the same question twice, so we'll answer the last one for you, mate. Uh, obviously, there's a bit of travel involved in your work. So uh, are you traveling with most of your kit or are you, taking it, are you hiring it when you're there? And if you are taking it, what's the best way to sort of transport it? Wow. We could spend a whole evening talking about that because I've had loads of experience of that. Um, yes, I take it with me. Definitely take it with me. I, I, there have been occasions where I've hired on... Uh, when we've got there, but very rarely. Uh, I take it with me because you, then you know what your kit is and you know what it is. Um, <clears throat> um, lots of issues to think about. Um, for instance, there's lots of issues with customs with, okay, first of all, number one, don't bother with a carne. I'm probably breaking the law by saying that, but I don't care. Don't bother with a carne. If you, uh, I, I did it once when I went to um, North America and Canada, and it was the bane of my life, and I'll tell you why, if you have a car, for those of you who don't know a car, you, if you're transporting goods from one place to another, strictly speaking, you're supposed to have what's called a car name, which is a legal listing of everything that you've got there, it's so that you can prove that you haven't sold it when I mean, you've gone somewhere else and then before you got back. The problem is, is that firstly, a carne has to use a carne company. They cost thousands of pounds, but they don't. They cost hundreds of pounds for them to put together this great, huge, thick, fat document for you. You then get to customs, and what you get is a, a very bored customs man who's 
been through his customs um, university and he's learned about carnets and you're the first person in about two years that's ever had one. So you'll then go, oh great, and he'll spend the next three hours going through the carnet with you and it's really boring and don't do it. So uh, that's my first tip. My second tip is uh, always take the fuses out, the battery packs of the lights, otherwise you'll be sitting having your cup of coffee before the plane takes off and announcements will come across uh, the town of saying, Mr. Bradby, will you please come to customs and they think that you're a terrorist with an exploding bomb. So um, it's quite a big deal that, it's quite important. And the third tip, and this is the absolute solid one of all, is that always carry your camera kit on your person, do not give it to anybody else and do not put it in the hold. And then secondly, when you shoot, you should be keeping it on card and on, uh, on at least one other separate device. So I have my stuff on card on hard drive and then I put it on a separate drive. Having done that, and lots of people do that, give the drive to your assistant because then two of you are separate. So if one of you loses your bags, you don't lose everything. Um, so those are my big tips for traveling. Uh, I hope that's helpful. Oh, Richard, that's absolutely brilliant, mate. And uh, thank you so much for tonight. It's definitely not going to be your first visit to a Photographer Academy webinar. I can promise you that. Yeah. As I said, we've already discussed. I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. And really thank you very much, everybody. I'm sorry I've gone on about over the time. I, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you're still there, and I hope your wives and partners don't, wives, husbands, boyfriends, partners don't kill you. Well, we had a few people come through saying that we've just had our partners join the webinar to see what they're missing. So that was quite All right. right. So, uh, the praise and the thank you, Richard. Yeah. Honestly, the, the the question panel lit up, mate. So, and that's from me as well. I mean, I had privy to seeing some of it, but now I've earned a lot more stories than uh, than we did when we started. So, and I loved it as well, mate. So, I really enjoy. I really, really enjoy talking to photographers because it's what I love. It's my passion. Like us all, you know, we don't do this for money. We do it for passion. The money helps, but. You know, you do it for passion, and that's that's the nicest thing of all. No, brilliant. We're definitely uh, going to be sitting you down and making a plan. We definitely want to work with, work with you, Richard. That's that's a given, without a doubt. But so, thank you so much for tonight. You you go off and uh, get onto your taxi duty.